because I watched at the most recent one I was at in Bali, Indonesia, the two countries standing in the way of the consensus leading to our next round of Kyoto, the next commitment period, was the United States under George W. Bush, and playing second fiddle was Canada. And I've, and I've been to a lot of international conferences, and I wear the little there, yeah, thing with the tag, and it has the Canada with the little flag there. It's a recognizable symbol. I've been to a lot of these things, and the response is what you would normally expect. People come forward. Oh, you're from Canada. I have a cousin in Canada. Do you know her? No, I don't. Oh, that's nice. Canada's great. We've got a great rep. That we use it all the time. Bali, Indonesia was the first time when people would come up, shake my hand, find out I was a member of parliament, then look down at the tag and take a step back. And, and then ask or be mad about it. What's wrong with you? And it was very frustrating to watch our representatives there present a position from Canada that I think is diametrically opposed to what most Canadians believe, which is that we should sign on to this agreement, that we should set targets and standards for ourselves, and that we should reduce greenhouse gas emissions nationally, globally, locally. I think most Canadians are there. I think Canadians have been ahead of the politicians for a long time. And here I was watching time and time again, our negotiators at the 22 tables that make up these climate talks, stalling at every single one. We were stalling at tables we had nothing to do with. We had no economy involved, we had no special, but the mission was simple and clear. Stall. Make sure no agreement happened. At the 11th hour, well actually the 13th hour, the, the whole session was over, and the Americans finally caved. And Canada, for 35 seconds, I'm not kidding, it was this moment, was standing on the stage alone, because the Americans had walked off and said, fine, let's do this, let's have an agreement of some kind. And the Canadian representative was stuck, because they didn't have instructions about this part of it. They didn't know what to do, so they scurried 35 seconds uh, later away. I think that... Uh, <laughs> Talking about lining up all levels of government, we actually have experience with this in Canada. Very, very successful. Called the Alberta Tar Sands. That 20 years ago, the Canadian government made this a mission under uh, Chrétien at the time, give or take 20 years, said, We will develop these sands, we will develop this energy, even though there's a bunch of barriers in the way. It's very expensive, no one really knows how to do it. But we believe that this is going to be in the national interest, so they lined up local federal, provincial, they put subsidies in place, which still exist today. Does everyone know this? That uh, if you're paying any federal taxes, you kicked in $1.3 billion this year to subsidize the tar sands. You kicked it in last year, you kicked it in the year before, you've been kicking it in since 1997, and you will continue to pay it until 2012, at a minimum. Alberta, thanks. That we lined up all of these interests in a direction to say that we were going to make this thing happen. Even though the marketplace said no. Even though the marketplace said that tar sands were not viable. I know that the original plans were more horrific than what we have now. They wanted to nuke the tar sands. Did you know this? This was a fascinating thing in the late 40s, early 50s, when we started to develop nuclear uh, technology to blow things up. They realized that if they could melt 200 meters below the surface in the vast majority of Alberta, you could just melt the tar sands and then suck it back up, but they couldn't get the radioactivity out of the oil, so they, they ditched the plans, although there is still one sitting in the Alberta legislature on the books. Here's the thing. Up until this point, in, environment groups and, and folks interested in the environment have been pushing this cause, have been pushing the idea about living without waste, with less waste, producing uh, less greenhouse gases. But most environment groups, and I say this with all respect to, to Julia and others, were ill-equipped to handle the economic side of this. That the Kyoto Protocol was an economic pact between nations, as much as it was an environmental initiative. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to put a cost on a pollutant. We're trying to put a cost on something that's never been costed before, which is a greenhouse gas. We're trying to internalize those costs into the role of doing business. That is actually a complicated thing to do. It requires a certain mindset. And we have been pushing the panic button on this climate change thing for a long time. The earth is ending, the earth is ending, the earth is ending, the earth is ending. And you can only hit the panic button so often before it doesn't have quite the same effect that it did the first time. When was the last time someone picked up a climate change article in the newspaper? It's been a little while. It's kind of dropped off the radar. This was the danger all the time in terms of elevating this issue to the top of the game. We now have to transition into this second piece. 
which is the fact of the matter is the environment and the economy overlap. I'm not saying anything I think would be too offensive to this graph. But I go back to my, one of my initial points, which is that there must, in the politics that Olivia and I work in, we work in the most inefficient buildings in Canada, by the way. I don't know if anyone's been to the Parliament buildings. My, one of my first weeks there, uh, uh, first months there, I was working at my desk kind of late at night, and, and I thought, God, I'm getting like arthritis. I, I, I'm, I was 31 and thinking, this is kind of an early onset for arthritis, but there we had it, and I realized that the single pane window that is in all of our buildings was blowing in Ottawa's January, a certain temperature across my desk, and was freezing my fingers with the keyboard. We operate and we work, and I think that's actually important. I think there's something symbolic about a country that chooses a buildings in which to house its leadership and has buildings that are the most inefficient and antiquated and have got we've got asbestos lining all our way. It's a travesty of those buildings. Let me let me end with one last thing. A, a little exercise I do with kids. Now maybe I'll do it with you guys too. Uh, we do, you know